Good morning. I think our guests should take seats now. I think that's what our plan is. We don't have name tags, so just spread around. We have much more comfortable seating than we usually do. That is because we love Canadians and we're always comfortable to have Canadians among us. Uh, I'm not sure why your country has such good humor at all times, but re I really appreciate it. And I mentioned to, to both of you that we have had all week an event on disinformation, <laughs> not, not, not caused by you, <laughs> but the Canadian contribution to a very serious and sober discussion has been superb. I mean, really top-notch um, thought leaders and elected officials from Canada this week. So, in case you're wondering who I am, I am Jane Harmon. Uh, I served in our Congress uh, nine for nine terms when it worked a little better than it does now. And I am president and CEO of the Wilson Center. Good morning, everyone. Nothing like a good conversation with Canadian friends to start a day and end a very long, very sober week. Thank you to Politico for your partnership. We appreciate it in putting this event together. Uh, I am told that our esteemed guests this morning, Scott Moe, the premier of Saskatchewan, and Jason Kenney, the premier of Alberta, came all the way to Washington just to visit the Wilson Center. <laughs> Absolutely. Is that true? Isn't that nice? <laughs> well, I think we should applaud you for doing something <laughs> sensible. Um, and we also hear that on the side, you're going to stop by at the National Governors Association. Correct. Meeting. You have our permission. But thank, thank you. you for, Appreciate it. For favoring us. Uh, the two premiers, whom Politico Executive Director Louisa Savage will introduce, are here to talk trade, energy, and the U.S.-Canada outlook for 2020. I am confident that their remarks will be a, as stimulating as a fresh cup of Tim Hortons coffee. <laughs> Have that right? Uh-huh. A double-double, yes. <laughs> double. <laughs> but before we get started, I want to call out a new member of the Wilson family. Chris Sands. Here, here. Right there. The stand up, stand up, take a bow, you know. The vaunted new director of our Canada Institute. After the departure of Laura Dawson, whom I think most of you know and knew, our previous director, Chris will have big high heels to fill. <laughs> Fortunately, his two decades plus working on the US Canada relationship makes him up to snuff. He was previously director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Canadian Studies and is a faculty member uh, at SAIS. He was elected in 2019 to his second two-year term as a member of the Executive Council of the Association for Canadian Studies in the United States, and he literally co-edited the book on U.S.-Canada relations in 2019. Uh, called Canada-U.S. Relations, that's an inspired title, <laughs> Sovereignty or Shared Institutions. How about sovereignty and shared institutions? You didn't ask me, that's what I would have said. But if that's not enough, he already knew Premiers Kenny and Mo personally before today's event, he's way ahead of the game. Uh, just goes to show that the Wilson Center has great affection for Canada. Many of Canada's top officials have been friends of ours and personal friends of mine, and we look forward to Chris continuing uh, this long and fruitful relationship. So, welcome to these new friends of ours. Uh, we have help from Louisa Savage of Politico, and Louisa moderated a conversation here at the Wilson Center back in 2018 on Canada-U.S. space cooperation. That was one of our really cool events, uh, as I remember it. Uh, as executive director for Canada, she oversaw the creation of Politico Pro Canada, before joining uh, Politico, she was the Washington bureau chief for McLean's, the national weekly news magazine of Canada. So please join me in welcoming Louisa along with premiers Scott Moe and Jason Kenny, and enjoy your coffee. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Jane, and good morning, everyone. I'm Louisa Savage, and we are just so pleased at Politico to continue our partnership with the Wilson Center as well as uh, with the Council of the Federation, which is uh, for our Americans in the audience, like the NGA, a uh, group of all the premiers. Um, I think, you know, 
a good opportunity to thank Jane Harmon for her dynamic and strong leadership at the Wilson Center, but also for always putting a spotlight here at the Wilson Center on Canadian affairs. This is really a precious forum in this town that brings people together um, and brings Canadians in to participate in the most important conversations going on in Washington. And I would like to also congratulate Chris Sands. I, I've known Chris a really long time. I think everyone here knows him, and it's hard to think of anyone um, who would be better equipped to really inform and elevate the conversation mm -hmm. about Canada here in Washington. So congratulations, Chris. Um, this is, as Jane mentioned, particularly exciting for me um, to be growing our journalistic footprint in Canada. We started a year and a half ago with a service focused on the Canada-US relationship and we had subscribers come in from Canada, from the United States, from Europe, from Asia, and they all told us one thing, the world wants more Canada. So now we're um, expanding our journalism in Ottawa and building a really strong team to cover everything from energy and environment to economic policy making, data policy, a technology. And I could not be more thrilled as a longtime Canadian journalist to be investing and building on the ground in Canada. So I hope you'll all join us in that effort. Um, so if you know Canada, you know that provincial governments are the key power centers uh, with jurisdiction over critical areas such as natural resources, education, health care, social services. So it's great to have two premiers with us today who are on the front lines of some of the biggest issues in Canada. Jason Kenney uh, is premier of Alberta, the Western Canadian province best known perhaps lately in the United States as home of Wexit, oh. which would be the Western separatist movement, which is distinct from Mexit which would be uh, <laughs> the uh, exit of the Sussex Royals to British Columbia. <laughs> Uh, Premier that's in British Columbia. <laughs> that's, right, that's right, exactly. Um, so Premier Kenny is originally from Oakville, Ontario, but we won't tell anyone that. Um, but he, and he grew up in Saskatchewan. Um, he studied philosophy in San Francisco, definitely we won't tell anyone that. Um, in the early 90s, he was an advocate for the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. I think that's when he first um, came onto the, the public uh, stage. He was first elected to Canada's House of Commons at the ripe age of 29 to represent the riding of Calgary Southeast, which is a great riding, I can attest, because it's where I grew up. And he was a member of the opposition Conservative Party and became a minister in the government of Stephen Harper holding several portfolios, including most notably citizenship and immigration, where he had a huge impact overhauling Canada's immigration system. Um, he was also Minister of Employment, Social Development, National Defense. Uh, after the defeat of the Harper government, he entered provincial politics, where he worked to unify conservative parties under a single banner of the United Conservative Party and became Premier of Alberta in 2019. Um, and if you read Lauren's story this morning in Political Pro Canada, he's also, um, according to the headline, Trudeau's loudest critic goes to Washington. So we're excited to hear what he has to say. Um, and Premier Scott Moe was born in Saskatchewan, grew up in a farm, on a farm, graduated from the University of Saskatchewan, and was first elected to the province's Legislative Assembly in 2011. He served as Minister of the Environment, as well as Minister of Advanced Education, and was elected leader of the Saskatchewan Party and became Premier in 2018. And he is serving as the chair of the Council of the Federation, which is like the NGA, and is leading the delegation of Premiers um, to Washington here today. And to moderate the conversation, I'm pleased mm. to introduce my colleague, Lauren Gardner, who's a Washington-based reporter for Politico Pro Canada. She covers Canada-U.S. relations, and her past beats include U.S. tax policy, environment, and energy policy. And she's from Philadelphia, but since she joined our Canada team, she's reported from everywhere from northern Quebec to the oil sands of Alberta to election night in Regina. Um, and she's also was, I believe, and tell me if I'm getting this right, Lauren, um, in Elizabeth May's living room when the news was breaking about a prime minister's past Halloween costume. <laughs> she's also um, published in-depth interviews with both premiers today, uh, this morning. So we're excited to have her uh, continue the conversation on stage with all of us today. So thank you, Lauren. Thanks, Lisa. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm so excited to be here this morning with uh, two Western Canadian premiers who have already given me a lot of their time this week, but I still have a lot of questions for them. I'm sure you all do too. Uh, we're gonna, like Louisa said, uh, we're gonna cover trade, energy, uh, also touch on the future of conservatism in Canada and how all of that affects the binational relationship. 
So uh, I'll get started with the, uh, the probably one of the biggest topics that brings you both to town, USMCA or CUSMA or new NAFTA, whatever you want to call it, please feel free. Um, the perception here in Washington is that in Canada, this is a done deal. It's going to happen. It's going to get ratified. It's just a question of when. But I wanted to ask both of you, do you think that assessment is fair or are there any potential stumbling blocks that we should be looking out for? Well, I'll, I'll just maybe speak uh, with respect to the most recent um, news release that we did or, or decision we did at the Council of Federation table where, first of all, I would say that assessment is fair. All of the premiers are in support of a swift ratification of, of the USMCA or the new NAFTA. Um, they uh, uh, came to a consensus on that and respectively the, the 10 provincial premiers, the three territorial premiers uh, represent by extension all Canadians. So we have called on on all federal parties and all federal parliamentarians uh, to very swiftly, uh, without delay, uh, ratify uh, this agreement because of the benefits that it extends uh, to, to all Canadians and, and I would say to, to a stronger North America as well. Ditto. Uh, but let me first of all say thanks to the Wilson Centre and Politico for hosting us. Congratulations, Chris, on your appointment. As, as I said, he's the eminence grease on Canada-U.S. relations, and he is getting a bit gray, actually. So um, <laughs> it could not be more suitable director. And, and uh, Chris actually taught my chief of staff, Jamie Huckabay, at Johns Hopkins. So thank you for uh, to, to develop tremendous Canadian talent. Um, we, um, we cert I think all of the premiers are agreed, all 13 of us, 10 provinces, three territories, that this should not become a matter of political uh, contention in Ottawa. The ratification of um, USMCA should proceed as quickly as possible. Uh, Scott's spoken about that on behalf of all of the provinces and territories. So you have a, a cross-partisan, cross-regional consensus in favor of rapid ratification. I think we all note that um, trade politics well, that there's a, 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 a reinvigorated protectionist sentiment in Washington on both ends of Pennsylvania Avenue, and we don't want to take any risks, any challenges, leave any gaps. We want to get this done. Uh, and uh, I may be known as uh, Justin Trudeau, Trudeau's biggest critic. I'm sure Scott would uh, covet that title in, in his province, but um, just so you know. We agree. Mr. Trudeau's already things. ended up with zero seats in our two provinces, and it's, there's a rather strong sentiment behind that. But, but we are uh, more than willing to work with, with Prime Minister Trudeau and his administration when it's in our common interest. And we are, at least I can speak for Alberta, always seeking common ground. And I believe that we have uh, um, virtually identical views about trade issues. Uh, and I want to commend uh, the uh, former Canadian Minister of Global Affairs and the new Deputy Prime Minister, uh, Christia Freeland, with whom we'll be having dinner tonight, right. together with the Premiers of Ontario, uh, Quebec and New Brunswick, uh, to discuss this. So uh, I think she did a brilliant job uh, in completing this, and uh, I think the revised agreement is an improvement on the original one, so we're, let, let's move forward. We cannot afford to risk for a day uh, trade stability in North America. But d despite the united uh, support among provincial and territorial premiers, the federal conservatives have voiced some concerns, particularly with dairy, aluminum, I've heard about forestry. Uh, are there any particular quibbles either of you individually have with the agreement, despite the fact that you do support it? Those, those concerns are real um, with respect to aluminum, forestry, dairy, uh, and that work is happening uh, right now on how we address those concerns, whether you know, the, 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 the culmination of the USMCA or the, the modernized NAFTA does not mean that we are finished with all of our trade challenges uh, with the United States or Mexico or, or any other uh, trading partner around the world. So we, we'll continue to work on, on the concerns where we have them. Uh, the forestry concern, for example, is, uh, is, a, is a concern for Saskatchewan, likely to some degree, and Alberta as well. But by far and away, the benefits uh, that we can have, not just uh, to Saskatchewan, Alberta, but to Canada and I would say to a stronger economy in North America by the ratification of this deal by all three partners and we know the US and Mexico are there and will be there shortly in Canada is my firm belief, um, far outweigh uh, any of the ongoing concerns that we may have on these specific items. So we'll work on those as we, as we continue on, um, but this is a beneficial agreement for, uh, for our nation and it most certainly I, I believe is a beneficial agreement for, for all three nations. So we've asked again as, as all premiers, all parliamentarians, all, all federal parties, and we're working with all federal parties as well to ensure that, yes, fair questions may be asked as it goes through our parliamentary process in, in Canada, 
but if for un, under no circumstances should it be a delayed held up or in any way we need to ratify this as soon uh, as we're I, able. I think the quicker it's ratified the quicker uh, our national government can get to work with the US on other issues like softwood lumber mm -hmm. uh, would softwood lumber be is, it, do you see that as the next big trade issue once this is ratified or is there something else no I, I th that's I think certainly Deputy Prime Minister Freeland's view and um, and uh, it, uh, as soon as we get done with uh, Kusma, I think she can, the two governments can move forward on that front. And um, pulling it back a little bit, uh, I wanted to quickly ask about uh, China. Uh, the U.S. and China have had some trade tensions of late. Canada and China have had trade and other issues as well. Um, I just wanted to get your quick assessment. How do you think the uh, Trudeau government is handling both the trade tensions with China and also the humanitarian issue of the two Canadians who have been detained? Well, with respect to China, Saskatchewan is likely uh, Canada's largest, uh, traditionally been Canada's largest exporter by value uh, to China. We send uh, a, a lot of product into China, both in the way of uh, potash as well as some agri-food products, canola oil, canola seed. And, and so this has been a challenging relationship for Saskatchewan uh, specifically. Uh, with, uh, with respect to how we engage with countries around the world as a nation, um, and how this, this current administration and our leaders is, in, is engaging with China. We, we have one foreign policy in our nation, and our, our province supports that foreign policy. And we will support uh, you know, our prime minister and our administration uh, with their approach uh, when it comes uh, to China. We're obviously waiting. We have, uh, uh, we're, we're waiting on a, a number of decisions uh, as it goes. But with respect to uh, the, the broader relationship of, of many nations, and, and we are very uh, connected with the United States, of course, as well, as they are our largest exporting market and our largest importing uh, source as well, um, we look forward to uh, trade agreements between uh, U.S. and China as well. We, we would always have some questions or concerns from a Canadian perspective. But I think as you look at the, the global economy as a whole, when you have two of the largest market-based economy, two of the largest economies uh, in the world, if they can come to some uh, level of, of trade agreement, if you will, that has to be positive for the broader, broader economy in the world. Yeah, and, and I, I uh, <laughs> this is Canadians who supposedly, uh, you know, we have this vicious disagreement with the Trudeau government, but here we are expressing that by saying, we support whatever the foreign policies of the national government because uh, we don't want, uh, to be blunt, we don't want the Chinese thinking that they can uh, divide Canadians and, to, and, to, and divide our provinces based on economic interests. We, we have faced in Alberta and Saskatchewan disproportionate economic uh, pain as a result of the dispute over the past year. Uh, the ban on canola as well as some of our uh, uh, pork and beef um, hit prairie farmers uh, particularly hard. But um, uh, it, uh, the ongoing detention of two Canadian, well, not just two Canadian citizens, I'm going to add into this because there was a hearing in, in, uh, in Ottawa with the uh, new ambassador to, uh, to Beijing recently. Uh, there are more than two Canadian citizens are to, that are detained. Hussein Jalil, a Canadian of, of Uyghur origin, has been uh, detained without consular access uh, after what was clearly a politicized trial 16 years ago. Um, so uh, Canada is, is not the antagonist in this relationship. Um, and uh, we are not going to allow uh, uh, that government, the Chinese government, to uh, violate the fundamental rights of Canadian citizens. Um, uh, we will uh, strongly support the efforts of the national government. Uh, to focus on their release, uh, and I think Canadians broadly uh, share that view. Well, we're going to move on now to a more contentious issue, to energy, uh, where maybe you will have some more disagreements you want to air. But first, actually, I do want to ask about, a there was a court decision this week in Canada uh, in favor of building the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion, which has been a very contentious issue uh, in both Alberta and Saskatchewan and in, the, in Canada in general. Premier Kenny, I, I want to know from you, both of you have had a lot of criticism of the Trudeau government wondering whether they even want to see the pipeline built. After the court decision this week and the actions that have been taken since uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was uh, won election last year, do you think he actually wants to see this built? Yes, and he has reconfirmed that every time I've spoken with him about it. After all, we, we, the federal government uh, bought this pipeline for $4.7 
billion dollars, uh, our underlying critique would, would be this, that, that we never should have been in that position and his arbitrary cancellation of the approved Northern Gateway pipeline in 2015 immediately upon taking office, plus his, I think, co a coordinated surrender to President Obama's veto of Keystone XL in October of 2015, plus the imposition of massive new and uh, uh, undefined regulatory requirements on the Energy East project halfway through after TransCanada has spent a billion dollars on the project, in addition to the new Environmental Assessment Act, Bill C-69, which some have described as the No More Pipelines Law, and the tanker ban on the Northwest BC coast, these policies together have constituted uh, a uh, broadly an anti-pipeline policy setting, and I think they, uh, they realized they had to do something to get at least some product to, to global markets or to be seen to be doing so. So we appreciate that effort on TransCanada. Uh, it is now absolutely clear as a result of two key recent court decisions, Supreme Court of Canada unanimously ruling uh, three weeks ago that the, that the British Columbia government in particular uh, cannot impede um, interprovincial pipelines, which are the exclusive regulatory authority of the national government. That's also important on any prospective future pipeline to the east uh, through Quebec. Uh, and more recently, the Federal Court of Appeal uh, this week uh, unanimously bringing very important clarity to the question of what is the, 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 the Crown's duty to consult. Those of you familiar with Canadian constitutional law will understand there's been this developing jurisprudence over um, a very vague um, uh, section of the Constitution dealing with, with Aboriginal rights. And the courts have been developing this into a duty, of the, of the honor of the Crown is expressed in a duty to consult First Nations. But what do you have, how do you do that when you've got many different First Nations with many different views on a particular issue. Basically, the federal court said, look, as long as there's a serious good faith effort, um, and if a project is still deemed to be in the public interest, we cannot allow the duty to consult to mutate into a right to veto a project. So this was important, not just for TMX, but for, for legal certainty in general. I want to go back to something you said um, about how the Prime Minister handled President Obama's veto of Keystone XL. What more could the Prime Minister have done, given that this is a cross-border pipeline, it's a cross-border project, both countries have their own separate jurisdictions, and as we all know in the U.S., it's well, been a long run. I would say, <laughs> Prime Minister Trudeau, what more could he have done? He could have done something. I mean, he, he was uh, the... the uh, an announcement of President Obama's veto of Keystone XL came 48 hours after Prime Minister Trudeau was sworn into office. And I have absolutely no doubt there had been back-channel conversations between his then Principal Secretary Jerry Butts and the White House that there would be no negative reaction, and there wasn't. It was a news release, and they walked on to the next issue. They never wanted that project, and they were not willing to uh, employ any uh, political or diplomatic leverage against a political decision by U.S. administration uh, to violate the spirit of NAFTA, which was about, in part, open a access to the U.S. market for our energy exports. So we think there's a reason. I think there's a reason why the Obama administration did not veto uh, the project in the several years that Prime Minister Harper was there waiting for an approval, because they knew there would have been. Uh, a very serious diplomatic con uh, conflict with Canada. Just if I could on that, all of that is absolutely correct. And, and you know, the, the fact of the matter is, in the result of, of some of these delays in, in our ability to get product not only east-west across the nation of Canada, but north-south as well, have resulted in oil moving by train. We're about 10% of our, our energy product moving out of Saskatchewan is moving by rail. What, what are you, you're at least that likely in Alberta. And the, the fact of the matter is, is that is not the way we should be moving that product. The, the indirect, con the direct consequence is it shouldn't be on there and we're actually in many cases receiving a lower value for one of the most sustainable products in the world of its kind, um, but it's cramping our rail capacity. This is true in not just Canada, but in throughout the Midwest uh, and, and throughout most of North America, we're cramping our rail capacity, capacity that we actually need if we are going to continue producing and exporting other goods that should be on the rail, like our agri-food products, like our timber products, like our, there's coal that's being moved out of, out of the Midwest uh, to areas around the world. There's, uh, we have potash that is moving uh, throughout uh, the Midwestern United States and across Canada, and, and we have an inability in some years to move those products because our rail capacity is actually being tied up with a product that 
should be in a pipe because it's safer, it's more efficient, and it's just quite simply where it should be. But, uh, and as we talk about Keystone, you know, there, there are two sovereign nations dealing with their own processes for how to approve something like this. What, what, what do you think you bring to the conversation in terms of advocating for something that is politically, it's outside of your domestic political control, right? Because it's, it's a U.S. process. So how do you balance that as, a, as representatives of another country trying to advocate for your position when it's another, another country that gets to decide whether or not this goes through? Well, we're obviously taking, we're in a different uh, administration here with a different policy on Keystone. And I want to thank uh, Mr. Trudeau's government for um, supporting our efforts to get to approval of, of Keystone XL. Obviously, look, we, we are subordinate to the national government when it comes to foreign relations. It's their exclusive constitutional jurisdiction, but there's a long history in Canada of provinces um, promoting their own trade interests and their own commercial interests. I think that's perfectly legitimate within the context of, a, of our country's uh, foreign policy. And our country's foreign policy is to have the closest possible trade relations with the United States. It is manifestly in the national interest that we get Keystone XL done uh, because it would represent um, tens of billions of dollars of export value to the Canadian economy. Tens, over its lifetime, tens of billions of dollars of government revenue. Uh, and, uh, and so um, uh, I do want to thank, uh, again, uh, Deputy Prime Minister Freeland, our, our, our acting ambassador in Washington, uh, for assisting with getting that message across uh, in Washington. Uh, there's no, obviously no resistance in the administration. We now have a second presidential um, permit, and it's now been supported by permits uh, from the Army Corps of Engineers and the Department of the Interior. TC Energy has given notice of its intention to begin construction this year. Um, and one of the reasons I'm here is to, to meet with the governors of uh, Montana, South Dakota, uh, Nebraska, and Oklahoma, as well as folks in Congress from those states, uh, just to reinforce their support for the project. And we're here for very much the same reason. I'm also here to um, you know, ensure that we can continue the dialogue and reaffirm our support uh, in, in Canada for the USMCA. Three things, essentially, and I think, Jason, you would agree with this, that, that we need in our province, and I, I think we need across Canada and across North America to be successful. And the first is, uh, I call them the three Ts, the, the trade, reg, trade and uh, regulatory environment. We need it to be competitive. It's different north and south of the border, um, but we do need it to be competitive, and I think in general we are. The second would be our trade agreements, and that's what we have been working on for the last 12 to 18 months in North America with the, the USMCA, and just one short step, it'll be ratified in in all three nations and that will be a positive for for the you know our food security our energy security and our economic security on this continent and last uh, but not least and this is a conversation that I think Premier Kenny is speaking to is uh, our transportation infrastructure and it's not just east-west within our nations it's north-south as well and and our our jobs our careers in our in our communities uh, depend on this there's energy that is produced predominantly in Alberta and Western Canada uh, Saskatchewan Newfoundland would be the next largest producers in in our nation, but much of that energy um, flows down in, into areas in Texas and Louisiana where there's careers provided there, value-added careers are provided in and adding value to that product and making it available to the world. So it's a, it's a cost-competitive product, it's an affordable product, it is a high-quality product, some of the highest quality energy that you can purchase around the world. And I would just say this as well, it is one of the most sustainable products that you can access around the world as well is, is not just Canadian energy but North American energy is it's, it's, it's filled all along the line on the way down and we should be very, very proud of that because when you compare uh, how that product is ethically produced, how that product is produced from, a, from an environmental perspective, we can be very proud. We have right now in front of our federal government uh, likely an application for an environmental assessment for what I would think would be the, the most sustainable oil sands project that would ever be built in, in the nation of Canada and, and you know we're very hopeful that that would uh, be approved and be approved in short order because of what it can do uh, for our, our global environment if you will producing some of the most sustainable energy available and we forget to to say that from time to time and it, I think it's important. Well you're giving me my transition because now I get to ask you about this project. This <coughs> is the Tech Resources proposed oil sands mine, the Frontier Mine. Um, I, I think this is also I think this has been cast as a, another litmus test for the Trudeau government, much like TMX was slash is. Um, I want to know from both of you, starting with Premier Kenny, how, how will you react if 
if the government denies the, the permit? <laughs> Uh, give, it, give us a taste. Maybe, maybe I would just uh, offer this and give uh, the Premier just one moment. A moment to uh, gather his thoughts. It, it, you know, I, 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 it would uh, really perplex, I think, many, including myself, and, and, and the reactions would be swift and, and direct. Uh, if the, the application for what would be one of the most sustainable oil sands project, one of the most sustainable energy products, projects in the world, uh, would not be approved in a, in a nation like Canada. Yes, it, it's hard to... Um, overstate uh, the response uh, of Albertans, not, not just our government, but Albertans broadly if, if this project were uh, to be rejected, uh, after uh, nearly a decade of a rigorous environmental process, uh, after this company tech, which has a global reputation as, a, as one of the most progressive mining companies on earth, spent a billion dollars uh, clearing every hurdle in the, one of the most rigorous environmental assessments on earth after it's engaged all 14 proximate First Nations with conditional benefit agreements, after it's proposed to spend, invest massively in technology that will uh, produce energy at uh, the lowest carbon footprint in the oil sands, or the 50% carbon intensity, carbon intensity, pardon me, that's 50% lower than the oil sands average, and a carbon intensity that's 50% lower than the average barrel of crude oil in North America. Um, I think this project represents a path to the future of the future of in the energy transition world. Over the next decades, as we go through the energy transition, we all know that there will be continued demand uh, for for crude, and uh, our basic uh, argument in Alberta is, and, and it should be our basic argument in Canada, is that in that world, it is preferable that the, the last barrel in, uh, in that transition period comes from a stable, reliable, liberal democracy with amongst the highest uh, environmental human rights and labor standards on earth. And so tech represents a pathway to that because if there's not additional capital development of uh, investment in the oil sands for future development, it's going to be a declining basin, which has the third largest oil accessible oil reserves on Earth, 180 billion barrels of proven and probable, a current global market value of $10 trillion. I cannot imagine why Canadians would walk away from that asset. That can also help us. You talk about the energy transition. We're also going through the demographic transition. We need to be able to pay our bills for our schools and hospitals, public health care, pensions and debts. And that's the kind of asset that allows us to do it. So finally, if the federal government says no to that, the response just won't, won't just be very uh, serious in, in Alberta, but I think it will be very serious in global capital markets because it would send a message that companies can come to Canada and spend hundreds of millions of dollars and years, a decade in this case, walking through a regulatory process in a country that is supposed to represent the rule of law and then an arbitrary political decision at the end of the process for, without any transparency can suddenly scut scut her, scuttle all of that? I think that would be a devastating message to send in terms of investor confidence at a time when we are struggling to attract inter, uh, foreign direct investment to the Canadian economy. So the response would, would be very challenging. Let's take politics out of it and just let's just say the government does approve the permit. The CEO of tech has already said that <laughs> this, it's a hypothetical. <laughs> let's say, but the CEO has said that the project may not be built. It, it will depend on pipeline access and also on world oil prices. Sure. So let's think about those um, and particularly the economics of this. Do you think the project in the end gets built? Well, the president of the company has said to me, absolutely, and I've met with his senior team who say, absolutely, they're confident that it will be built, but it can't be built without a permit. Now, those, those considerations are being kicked around in Ottawa right now. People say, well, maybe they won't, maybe they won't raise the capital. Maybe the right market conditions won't prevail. That is a, those are commercial considerations. That is not what is before the federal cabinet, which is a ratification of a regulatory decision on the environmental impact and on Indigenous consultation effectively. So, so um, to introduce extraneous issues, look, we don't have a regulatory process for the federal cabinet to, de to, de to determine whether a project is commercially viable. That's for the board of the company to determine, not for, the, uh, not for a bunch of, uh, of politicians to determine. If suddenly we are completely changing 
uh, the regulatory approach in Canada to one of, of, of a transparent uh, uh, approach to, to environmental regulation, to a kind of arbitrary political second guessing of a commercial viability of a project, then why would anybody invest in Canada? So I think it's a very dangerous path to go down. And in terms of just generally the commercial viability, I think there's, there's um, a critique of the oil sands in, in the US and elsewhere, which is a bit outdated based on sort of decade old data in terms of costs and so forth. The fact is that during the last five tough years, our producers have compressed prices by their, their costs by about 30%. And uh, generally, they, they're, I mean, they're making good money, they're, they're, they're paying down debt, they're buying back shares, they're improving their balance sheets, they're paying out good dividends, they've got good cash flow. And, 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 and tech would not have gone this far with a billion dollar upfront investment if they didn't think this was viable uh, in a number of scenarios. So I think this project kind of casts into stark relief. The, I think there's three main issues that really affect projects like this. It's, it's government regulation, it's uh, the economics of oil in general, and, um, and also and th having access to a way to get it out of, of wherever it is, so pipelines, rail, what have you. G given that all of these factors work together to make, something, to make a project viable or not, what do you each see um, as being the factor that's most making the seesaw tilt in the what you would call the more difficult direction of being able to to get these things off the ground, Premier Mel. Well, I I would begin uh, with the fact that this project is part of a of a broader Western Canadian energy industry, right? And so the the product that they would produce, and we've talked about how it would be uh, some of the most consulted on and, and sustainable energy that would be produced in in uh, in its own uh, area of that industry. Um, but you know, one of the challenges that we have, and I spoke to it earlier, is the infrastructure on how we actually get this product out of Western Canada to uh, other areas of North America where it can have value added to it and create careers uh, there. And then offer, uh, you know, what is a comparatively sustainable product to other, uh, other Americans, other Canadians, and, and other people around the world. That's the goal here. Uh, and, and so uh, Premier Kenny has spoken with respect to, uh, to TMX. We have uh, the, uh, the KXL, uh, the Keystone XL uh, discussion. Those are all very, very necessary projects, uh, not only for this particular project, pro uh, uh, project, but for the Western Canadian industry as a whole. I said earlier, we're, we're railing out 10% of our energy re resource out of, out of the province of Saskatchewan. We had an incident yesterday morning, uh, just as I was getting on a plane to come down here, uh, where we have 30 some cars that are, that are ha ha came off the rails and we have uh, our firefighters are hard at work uh, putting uh, getting that situation under control, and I believe uh, they're very close uh, to doing that. That's a product that shouldn't be on uh, that rail, and it's uh, it's t t these these projects that continued need to continue to be moving forward in a an environmental sustainable environmentally sustainable manner with a process a, a regulatory process that is defined and science based and is focused on the safety of, uh, of, of the people along the line and focused on ultimately uh, getting uh, this, this product out in, in, the, uh, in the safest manner and in the greenest manner and in the most economically viable manner. And, and, I, and I think I agree with that. In addition, you ask me, sir, what's the, uh, what's the tipping point on, on an issue, on a decision like this? I think obviously the national government is very focused on uh, the interplay between an application like this and the country's commitments to reduce uh, uh, CO2 emissions. Um, as part of the, the Paris Treaty. So let me take that on very directly. Uh, Prime Minister Trudeau's government did negotiate with my predecessor, Premier Notley's government, uh, a notional 100 megaton cap for the Canadian oil sands. Uh, right now, we're at about 67, 68 megatons uh, per annum of CO2 emissions from the Canadian oil sands. Tech Frontier would add about plus four megatons, taking us to uh, the low 70s. Well, you know, still 30, 25, 30% below the negotiated cap. So I told Prime Minister Trudeau the day after I was elected, I was prepared to, to talk to him, to negotiate uh, uh, a potential kind of ratification of that 100 megaton cap, as long as we could see a pathway to it for a future, a sustainable future of the industry. And we haven't really heard back from his government on that point yet, I hope that we will. Uh, the, the point is this, like here I am, a pro, unapologetically a, an apologetic booster of the Canadian energy industry, I just imposed a $30 a ton price on industrial emissions of CO2 uh, that will, uh, that affects over half of our emissions and uh, will get us a long way towards uh, 
national targets on controlling CO2 emissions. Uh, we have, we're investing billions of dollars in new green tech uh, to help reduce in emissions. The industry is as well, as, as is the government. Um, we're working on uh, conventional environmental issues very aggressively on caribou and, and bison and wildlife habitat. We're, we have more and more First Nations coming on board as partners in resource development, including in this particular mine project. Um, our goal, and we invite the federal government to work with us on this, is that it, we should have an industry that offers uh, energy in the, during the transition period that is low cost, low car carbon, and low risk. And, 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 and th this really should matter to the United States because what you see is the you know, cooling of investment and access to capital for the Permian uh, Basin. Uh, so you're going to have, I, I, pr I think most people project, you, you've probably peaked in terms of oil production in the United States. You've got a whole bunch of refineries on the Gulf Coast that are desperate to process heavy crude. Venezuela is no longer available really as a reservoir. We are. This is a very important strategic issue for the United States as well. If, if I could I on this, Lauren, just uh, there's one thing I want to add to that. And we, the, uh, the, the fact about in, uh, intensity of our emissions is very, very important here. And you have two people up here that are very pro-industry, very pro-energy, um, talking about the impact on, on climate, if you will, the impact on emissions. And we talked about this project being uh, the most sustainable uh, from an emissions perspective in, in its uh, area of the industry. We, we have uh, projects in Saskatchewan as well, uh, just along the Alberta border, uh, that are reducing their methane emissions by some 40, 45 percent. Uh, there is no one that is doing more for uh, the conversation around carbon reductions and emissions reductions and, and the, the, the broader conversation around global climate change than the energy industry in particular. We'll speak, I think, to Western Canadian energy industry, but I think it's true across the board. We had a, 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 a millions of dollars of investment that went into a refinery in Moose Jaw to expand their, their production by about 30%, but they reduced their carbon content in each barrel of oil that comes out of, out of that refinery, not to 30% incremental barrels, but each barrel of oil by 20 to 25%. It's happening time and time and time again in this industry, and it's an industry that we can be very proud of, and it would do us well to make it available to the world. I want to bring it back now to Canadian politics real quick before we get Sorry. to some audience questions. We, we love talking <laughs> energy up here. <laughs> um, My apologies. That's all right. Uh, I, Something we referenced earlier today was the, the election in October. Um, it returned Prime Minister Trudeau to, to power, but in a minority setting, um, no Liberals were elected in Alberta or Saskatchewan. What should the audience here take away from the both of you today about what that election meant for Canada? Well, I, I would say it speaks to the divisions that we that we have in our nation, uh, within, within our nation, if you will, and the conversations uh, that we're having, and there's a number of them. Um, and the, the uh, you know, I think that in fairness manifested itself on election night with the results that we saw. I'll speak to Saskatchewan, uh, zero uh, Liberals and there's 14 Conservative MPs uh, there. So I, I've always said uh, since that day that the, this federal administration, the Prime Minister, uh, has, uh, you know, a duty to listen um, to those 14 MPs that the people chose. Um, also a duty to listen to the, the provincial government and to, uh, you know, take advice at times from the provincial government and myself who will be speaking on behalf of the provincial government when it comes to issues that are important to Saskatchewan and he is a Prime Minister for the, all of the people of the nation and, and not just in, in specific parts where he may have been successful in this election. The same holds true uh, for, me, for me provincially as, as well. In saying that, I would, I would say this, um, a very uh, a move, uh, an appointment that I would commend the Prime Minister for is the appointment of uh, Christopher Freeland as the Deputy Prime Minister and as the, the Minister responsible for working uh, with all of the Premiers across the nation and the provincial governments across the nation. We've had the opportunity to open up a, a, a strong dialogue, I would say probably the strongest dialogue um, that we have had since uh, the, the Liberal government uh, came to power just over four years ago and that's appreciated and it's an ongoing relationship that I, that I look forward to and, and it's an open relationship and it's, as I said, the, the, uh, the, the, strongest, uh, the strongest conversations that we've been able to have on behalf of our province. What difference, quickly, what, what difference do you think, what tangible difference have your criticisms of Ottawa brought to each of your provinces? What, what, what have you gotten any results? Well. First, I, on, your, on your last question, I would just say that the result, I think the results speak for themselves in terms of the sentiment in, in the Prairie West. Uh, on w tangible results, uh, look, um, I think the, 
to, to Prime Minister Trudeau's credit, I think he understands that there is a, a, a very serious challenge here. And um, every Canadian, because of the history of, of Quebec in modern Canada, uh, every modern Canadian Prime Minister is very conscious that their first obligation is to ensure and, and try to strengthen national unity. And um, in some respects, that unity is being impaired now, particularly in Western Canada. And I think he understands that. And he said that to me and, I, I, and to other premiers. I think the appointment of, of Deputy Prime Minister Freeland with a clear mandate to address those concerns, those, those regional concerns about fairness in the Federation is a very positive step forward. Christia grew up in Alberta. She understands that the, the, the real frustration and anger that exists uh, about, uh, about federal policies. And we've entered into, I think, a, a respectful um, dialogue. We've seen some progress on some issues. So for example, um, we managed to get an equivalency agreement with the federal government on our uh, regulations for, to, to reduce uh, emissions from, from major industrial emitters. Uh, we finally have got into, gotten into a conversation with the federal government on a, an equivalency agreement over methane regulations, uh, which is very positive. We're uh, talking to them about things like caribou habitat and a number of other issues. We are lined up on trade policy and trying to be helpful in this respect. Uh, so I think more and more we're finding areas of common ground. We've identified a number of other actions Ottawa could take, one of which would be giving us some kind of, Alberta at least, and Saskatchewan, some fairness on fiscal transfers in the very complex system of fiscal transfers in the Federation, where we contribute net about $20 billion a year to the rest of the Federation. We're asking for a little bit of that back that has been capped for a huge decline in revenues, and, and they, it looks like they're taking a serious look at it. So I'm hopeful that we'll continue to make progress uh, and uh, we have a much more constructive relationship now than we did before the election. I have one more broad brush question before we uh, ask the audience if they have anything they'd like to ask. Uh, the Republican Party here in the United States has undergone a transformation in the last four years, four or five years. And I'm wondering what lessons do you both take as con little c conservative voices in Canada? What lessons are you taking from that? What, what are you seeking to replicate or to avoid? Well, I'll, maybe I'll take a first stab at that. So, I um, uh, not sure we, we, we I'm not, not sure we want to take any lessons from <laughs> what's happening in American politics. It's quite the show, to, I have to say, to watch. Uh, <laughs> but um, I, uh, I, um, Stephen Harper, my former boss, wrote uh, I think a pretty thoughtful book about some of these themes last year, and. Um, with, with, with views on, on, on how populism emerges and different kinds of populism. Uh, I, I, and, and one of his uh, themes with which I agree is this, that if, if political leaders and, 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 and elites generally uh, ignore the, 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 the real tangible concerns of ordinary people, and worse yet, if they deride, mock, and marginalize those concerns, then they are inviting the development of not just populist movements, but angry populism, which sometimes can can do, uh, um, which can sometimes have very uh, negative consequences. So, I think one of the reasons we've we've managed to avoid some of the developments you've seen in American and and, and European politics uh, is because I'll tell you a couple of examples. We. We have a properly managed immigration system, which is open and welcoming, but which has rules, and which does not tolerate widespread illegal or irregular, or irregular migration, which has turned public opinion in both Europe and the United States against even legal migration in many respects. So that, that's le lesson one. Lesson two, because we allowed the development of our energy industry, that became an, a, a kind of employment offset for many folks who got dislocated by globalization and automation. They were able to shift into good paying jobs and from the despair of unemployment to the dignity of work and the thrill of opportunity, many of them literally moving from central and eastern Canada to Alberta and Saskatchewan, fueling our population growth and our national prosperity. So the, you know, this is why the, the, the frustration in our provinces is of, is of concern to me, because it's many of those same people who, whose you know, peers in the United States ended up in, in devast economically devastated community, facing an economic dead end. In Canada, they had an opportunity, 
And in many of the U.S. states, in much of the upper Midwest, and eastern Pennsylvania and places like that, its, its energy development's been fracking and so forth. It's been the, 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 the only economic lifeline. So I guess one parallel I would draw here is to the folks in, among some of our elites, elites who want to shut down the North American energy industry, um, please understand what the social and economic consequences of that will be. They won't be pretty. Premier Mel, do you have any quick And answer? I agree with all of that. The, the fact of the matter is, is recipe for success in Saskatchewan is so very simple. We, we, we have uh, those three things that I spoke about, the three T's, the tax and regulatory environment, the trade agreements, and the, uh, the transportation system, so that we can attract investment from all around the world. It creates jobs, it attracts people. We, we have grown our province over the course of the last 10 years like we have not grown for over 80 years in, the, in, in Saskatchewan. Much of that due in, in large part to some of your doing in, in your federal role as Minister of Immigration. We have uh, benefited hugely uh, from immigration with over 150 countries of uh, people from over 150 countries have come into our province. I believe they're responsible for, for around 100,000 of our 170,000 people that have come in over the last decade. So we've been very welcoming uh, to that, but it's only available because of the strength of our economy um, and those careers are available for people to come here, but also for, for our children to stay. So we're, we're quite excited about that as we move forward. What we see in the way of, of, of potential um, <laughs> risks or, or, or opportunities or whatever people will call them around things like populism and populist uh, uh, politics are, and we saw, is when you have divisions uh, across our nation. We saw some of that manifest itself in, in our province on, on, on federal election night. So, we're very aware that it is, uh, you know, present. There are sharp edges to that sword, uh, for sure. And but we, I, I think, in Canada, um, are very quick to separate some of the ideolog ideological politics, if you will, from from doing the right thing. We're very focused in Saskatchewan on on just those things, you know, growing that economy, growing uh, that opportunity, um, attracting that investment from around the world, and we don't veer too far from that. Um, what we do with the benefits of that is reinvest it back into our communities and hospitals, healthcare, highways, uh, the things that people expect their provincial government to invest in. So it's there, but I wouldn't say it's there to the degree that it is in other areas of the world. All right. uh, we have a few more minutes. If anyone from the audience has a question, I see a hand up in the back. I don't know if there's a microphone. Yes, there is. Thank you, uh, Paul Cadero from the University of Toronto oh. um, at the Monk School. Um, it is impressive to come and listen to two great Canadians talk without gaslighting. And I want to thank you for being great Canadians this morning. As I say that as someone from Toronto. <laughs> um, I'm puzzled uh, though, or perhaps I should ask the moderator as well, Wexit keeps coming up. And I'm just wondering, having listened to you as responsible premiers, what you see your role is to preserve Canadian unity against what I think is a rump group, but nonetheless, Canada has so much in, to talk about on which there is common ground, sure. and there's all this noise. What do you see your role to be as stopping it? Well, I. I sometimes get criticized in Alberta for this, but I am, I all, every day I reinforce that I am an unapologetic Canadian patriot and federalist, and I always will be. I do not believe patriotism can be conditional. Um, and I agree with you that the, the Wexit movement uh, is, a, it could be characterized as a uh, rump movement, but the sentiment is not. The sentiment is real, a, and, and it, it would be a huge mistake for political leaders to dismiss or deride that. Uh, by which I mean, it doesn't have a, like a coherent organized pres presence at this point, uh, uh, but a a as a proud Canadian, I don't want it to develop that a coherent, uh, that, that the potential uh, threat to the future of the Federation, which is why we are trying, our government is trying to take very seriously the, the, the concerns that underlie that. Now, we, in the polling, we see 25 to 30% generally saying they, they support secession from the Canadian Federation. I think some of those people are just blowing off steam. And when you, when you drill down a little bit uh, and really push those people, that number tends to go down to about 15%. But on the other side, 75 to 80% of the people in my province are t consistently telling pollsters that they understand or sympathize with that sentiment. <coughs> that is not a rump sentiment. 
That is, and as I said this to the Prime Minister, that's across the social economic geographic spectrum. And, and so we have to take those concerns seriously. So we've uh, created a, 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 what we call a fair deal panel to do broad consultations with Albertans um, and, and we've asked them to look at a number of possible policy reforms, some of which involve potentially replicating the kinds of, of, of powers employed by Quebec and Ontario that are completely legitimate within the Canadian Federation, potentially provin uh, provincial pension plan because we have a young demography that would be to our net fiscal advantage, potentially provincial police force because rural Albertans are not particularly satisfied with the service they're getting from the RCMP, potentially a potential a provincial revenue collection agency and, and other measures. Um, so we are looking at an alternative. If, if, the, if, it's, if it's the status quo versus radical change, a lot of my uh, Albertans are going to opt for radical change. I, I think what what we want is, is, what we need is a fair deal in the Federation. That's what we're trying to articulate. And I think that's very much in the spirit of what previous Western leaders like Peter Lougheed did. This uh, bounces off our last question as well with respect uh, to, to why this conversation is even uh, there. It's, it's around some of the divisions that we're seeing uh, in our nation. Uh, many of the people I talk to, and there's different levels of this, it is a sliding scale. I don't actually, when you drill down into the conversation, don't actually want to separate from Canada. Some do but many don't. Uh, they actually want to separate Saskatchewan or Alberta from some of the policies that have been imposed uh, or that we felt have been imposed on, on those very industries that we are uh, utilizing, sustainable industries that are, we are utilizing that are creating wealth in, in our communities across our provinces. And, and that's where the crux of the discussion is. And it gets back to the ideological or the, the, uh, the populist uh, feelings uh, that are out there. And that's where uh, this uh, this wexit, if you will, or this sentiment of separating our industries, our province, our, our communities from some of these policies that are being uh, administered to us. L listen, I, I've spoken to this a number of times, and and we need to get back in our nation uh, to being uh, Canadians first. Uh, get away from these regional divisions that we have. We have a great Canadian economy, and it's just that we have. Uh, uh, in the same way that I spoke about the energy industry creating wealth in, in the Prairie Provinces, also uh, by extension through uh, the creation of a pipeline and creating wealth in the construction and the operation of that pipeline all down into the Gulf Coast, creating wealth and careers in that Gulf Coast and the refineries that are adding value to that uh, comparatively sustainable product, very sustainable product. Uh, we do that across our nation as well. And we do it very well. And when we create wealth in, in, in our industries in Saskatchewan and Alberta, that wealth is by extension shared with all Canadians. When there is a, a, an auto plant that is doing well in Ontario, it isn't just good for the community and the families that live in that community. It's, it's good and it's strong and it's a good thing for all Canadians. And we've, we've gotten away from that into these regional conversations over the course of the last number of years. In, in some respect due to some of the policies that disproportionately are affecting industries in certain areas of, of, of Canada. And we need to get back to a more collective conversation, a more collaborative conversation. And I, I actually see that starting to happen at the Council of Federation table where we have come to consensus on a number of items, a number of items that I, that I would offer. It would do very well for this minority administration to, to pay heed to. What, one time for one more quick question, if there is one. I see <coughs> I, I, someone with the microphone. <laughs> Hi, it's Stanley Cook. I'm a political science academic with US EPA. Uh, a broader question, but related to some of your discussion, uh, 1867, if my memory is correct, we had the British North American Act. Correct. Uh, now we have the, some people would call the Trudeau Constitution, the father 80, of the present yeah. Prime Minister. In terms of the division of powers of federalism, how would you compare those two documents in terms of the locus of power in Ottawa versus the provinces? And feel free to talk about other federal systems if you want. Lightning round version. Yeah, well, uh, I, you know, the, the 1982 Constitution did not significantly modify uh, the division of powers, which, is, which was quite a decentralized federation. Uh, in, in the uh, 1867 original constitution, except in one important respect. Um, my predecessor, Peter Lougheed, who had been in a huge, history repeats itself, in a huge fight with a Prime Minister Trudeau over energy issues, managed to secure a key amendment called uh, Section 92, uh, in, in Section 92.1 of the con Constitution, um, 
which is, gives the provinces the exclusive authority to develop their own natural resources in their borders. Uh, and in the past, that was ambiguous. The federal government interposed itself in that area. That is really what's at the heart of much of what we've been talking about here for the past 90 minutes, because we now, in our estimation, have a federal government that is ignoring that in many ways. So that was a critical power that reinforced our ability to develop our resources. And ultimately, we end up sharing that, the rest of the country, in enormous ways. $600 billion of net transfers up from Albertans to the rest of the Federation, Saskatchewan, uh, in recent years has been a con net contributor as well. So Let me jump in real quick, just in case Premier Mao has a thought on that. Sure. Yeah, the wrap around, I apologize. I, I know, I, I would just agree with everything uh, Premier Kenny has said and what we're seeing now. Disagree? I agree. Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it almost happened. And, 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 what, and what we're seeing with uh, some of the initiatives, and this speaks to the, the entire conversation that we've been having and, and the policies that, that many feel have been disproportionately imposed on, on a number of industries, is you're seeing uh, it going to the courts for, for clarification. We just saw that with the uh, Trans Mountain Pipeline deal where it's been clarified that this is in the, in the federal uh, realm decision-making. Energy East or any East uh, pipeline would follow the same the same precedent. Uh, we're seeing a split decision in our province where we took a, uh, a, a carbon tax uh, case to the, to the provincial court. We saw a 3-2 uh, decision in favour of the federal government. Likely, uh, it's my th thoughts that we may have a different decision in, uh, in Alberta where we argued a, a few weeks ago and we'll be looking for the outcome there and we'll ultimately end up in the Supreme Court of Canada this, this March. So the fact of the matter is uh, we have a um, and it speaks to the entire conversation we have. We have a federal government that is challenging the, 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 uh, the limits, if you will, with respect to the Constitution, and you're seeing provinces uh, to start to push back in, in the courts of law across the nation on a number of different topics. And so uh, we'll, we'll find our way through this. Um, we, we will as a nation, um, but there's always a few bumps along the way. Well, we're out of time this morning. Thank you all so much for coming. I think we learned a lot about where these guys are on trade, energy, future of Canada. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so Great much. Questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.